So I wanted to revisit this idea about AI and software development. So I recently did a video where I showed that I wrote better code than what ChatGPT was presenting to me. And at the time I was satisfied with that result, but it then started to bother me. It started to nag at me because I'm like, billions of dollars have been put into this thing and there is no way, absolutely no way, I could write better code than what I'm getting from ChatGPT. Either I'm talking to it the wrong way or it's simply, um, it's simply an anomaly. So, so I decided I'm going to go back. <clears throat> we have an updated model. We got 4.0. And I said, you know, I'm going to go back and I'm going to, I'm actually going to share my code with ChatGPT. I didn't the last four or five times that I worked with it to see if it could produce a better result than I had designed privately and independently. But I just had to see. I was so curious. So I started out asking it a question. I said, consider that I have a PDF file. And this PDF file, it has a table of population data, right? The population data is in table format. And I use a tool such as XPDF Utils, the PDF to text uh, uh, program. That's part of that Utils package with the dash table flag. Now, of course, I later learned that that dash table flag only applies to the Windows version of PDF to text. In the Linux version, it's the dash layout flag. Anyway, that's a small detail. Anyway, so long story short, this uh, PDF to text program is going to generate a text file. I want to import this table of population data into a database table. But that's actually irrelevant. I just wanted to give ChatGPT, the large language model in this case, some context. So I'm here just having more of a conversation with it now than I did previously. So I go on to say the easiest way to do this is to write a, C, a program in C Sharp that can read each line of data and import the line of data into a database table whose schema matches the population data. The problem is PDF to text is going to uh, put the data as several spaces between each column. And I go on and on and on here to describe the situation to uh, ChatGPT. I didn't do that last the last couple of times. I actually wrote a more concise and shorter version of this. And so I was thinking this time, maybe that's the problem. Maybe that's why it never gave me the right result to begin with because I simply didn't put enough information here. And to my credit, I feel like I shouldn't have to because, hey, it's AI. It should really understand what I mean. But I've known from other projects I've done using the AI that you pretty much have to write a book. You pretty much have to write a book in order to get a result out of this particular implementation of AI. Now, there are other implementations out there like Microsoft Copilot that might be a little simpler, that might give better results the first time around. Maybe, maybe not. But I've seen some things done through Microsoft Copilot that's a little more straightforward starting out than what you sometimes get when you're using ChatGPT from OpenAI. But that's cool. I'm going to use ChatGPT from OpenAI. At this point, I'm used to it, and I like the way I work with it than I've seen with other tools. Anyway, so it goes on and it interprets what I've asked it, and it comes up with this regular expression. I tested the regular expression, and the regular expression is fine. It's just that when I run it, it's slower than handwritten code or even regular code and actually 
let me take this back. This this one is not fine. This one has an error. So first time around, it gives me a regular expression that's an error. It doesn't meet the, the requirements. So I go and I give it a little bit more information. Let's just go ahead and make it very obvious to it, to the large language model, what is missing. So it comes back and it makes a refinement. I test this and it does okay. All right, so then I'm going to test this out in Linux this time, right? So I go ahead and I handwrite this in Linux. So after I handwrite it in Linux, right, um, we go through and we get uh, everything set up in Linux. So then I give it another chance to actually write the regular code, write it as regular code rather than a regular expression. Because I want to see if it can handle that. Because that seems to be where it's having difficulty. And sure enough, no matter how many rounds I go, it doesn't get it right. So I then finally tell the large language model that it doesn't get it right. And it immediately tries to, first it tries to update its, its memory, right? Anyway, and then it just doesn't get it right no matter how many times. And I, I just basically ignore all of those you know, because I've seen it before. So then I finally, after all these sessions, copy and paste my code into this discussion here. I copy and paste this code to see what it thinks, what it comes up with. And it's able to explain what I've written and that's fine. But I'm more interested in seeing how it will identify the algorithmic nature of what I've written. What algorithm does, does the code I've written uh, represent? Because I've studied algorithms over many years. And here recently, I've been um, ex exploring algorithms at a deeper level, just to see what happens, right? Just out of curiosity. Because I've read Dr. Donald Knuth's The Art of Computer Programming, and that has helped me get certain to a certain level in my programming abilities. But I'm reading these other program, these other algorithm uh, books here recently, and I'm just uh, curious. Okay, what algorithm does? my algorithm represent and I haven't found a close analog to what I've been reading so I'd say okay let's see what ChatGPT comes up with when it studies the code I've written and it says that my code is an example of a state machine algorithm and I will admit this in my actual programming work in my career <clears throat> my best programs the ones that I love and I use that word on purpose because there are certain programs that I actually love that I've written in the past my very best ones the ones that are quintessential Michael Gaucher programs they are finite state machines and I've written some really amazing finite state machine programs and it turns out it is my my natural style it wasn't always when I first started my career in programming I didn't really deal with that that much until I started uh, working in web development where in the early days of web development um, using a, a technologies called active server pages for example you use case statements and using case statements to inspect the HTTP request um, somewhat naturally leads you down the road of 
finite state machines. But then, as I started building more back-end systems, right, and I started using much more object-oriented programming, then I got away from finite state machines until some problems that I would run into dealing with data absolutely demanded that I used a finite state machine in order to control chaos and have real structure and real performance in what I was putting together with those 300,000 and 500,000 line programs that I was putting together and but I never saw FSM as a as an algorithm in all that time and then in recent years I've had some I had a very interesting program I wrote one time and I had just finished reading uh, Dr. Canoose The Art of Computer Programming uh, books one and two and I was influenced from Dr. Canoose work to implement uh, finite state machines in a way that allowed me to essentially do the equivalent of Google's map and reduce on gigabyte files so that I could process gigabyte files in a few seconds rather than take a couple of hours. So anyway, I was very proud of that. That was a real breakthrough for me in my application of computer science. And I was just very surprised and very pleased with ChatGPT's conclusion on what my coding style and what I build. So anyway, <coughs> I have a conversation with um, ChatGPT here about um, my history with finite state machines and you know it, it's telling me the benefits of using the FSM approach and another funny thing is that I actually have written on paper here recently that um, that my programming style was going to be FSM driven so this is where a little bit of spirituality starts to get into play right it's like um, something's telling me I'm on the right right direction so anyway and so I'm just going through this conversation here and what I want to share with you is something that this um, large language model is bringing out and that is um, I'm, I'm gonna skip through a lot of this right uh, let's see because it's really just a conversation and it just keeps generating this code and it, it doesn't need to keep doing that I'm not asking it to generate code but every time I say something it generates code and I'm like okay yeah because because I don't need, need need any code right now so here we are and it's talking about the the um, because you know I was telling about uh, you know I'm reading these algorithm books right and I just want to see what it comes up with because I'm trying to pin it down on a more contemporary um, explanation of the of the code style that I, I've demonstrated but what it's saying is that my code style doesn't match contemporary um, uh, traditional this uh, code descriptions right so that's essentially what it's saying in this paragraph here right and so here it's um, showing that basically I'm using design patterns and I'm using a, an approach to coding and systems design that um, that basically um, mirrors the way that um, systems are designed today so and then what I'm saying to it is you know I, I just kind of want to go uh, back to the discussion about my algorithm for converting spaces to tabs and I was like you know it looks like the LLM 
is much more biased towards using data from Stack Overflow or GitHub or, or places like that that don't have coding styles that um, mirror the type of, of approach that I use. And it's essentially saying that I'm correct and that um, it tries to suggest um, when you ask it to um, define a code solution, it's going to pull from the more common, um, the more common approach, the more crowdsourced approach of what that solution should represent. It also is biased towards solutions that are uh, quick to implement and understand, quick to understand, quick to implement and understand, right? Which may not necessarily be the right type of solution for a given problem. Sometimes you need something that is much more sophisticated, much more nuanced, refined, right? And so if it's pulling from the more common, because that's why when I work in computer programming jobs, you know, every once in a while I would look at Stack Overflow, but I could never bring myself in most cases to copy and paste from Stack Overflow because it's like, yeah, it kind of puts you in the right direction, but when you, the split second, you're going to take that suggestion and make it production grade, it's not going to look anything like what you see on Stack Overflow or, or Stack Exchange or places like that. So I could see now why I have an aversion to what ChatGPT is going to put out there um, when I work with it, right? Because it can kind of say, it can kind of show you the, the general direction, you know, but it doesn't really, um, it doesn't have, and then it gives some 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 uh, suggestions for getting towards that specificity, but I don't think it, I don't think um, its recommendations here are going to work for two reasons. Number one, once again, I don't have time to write the equivalent of a blog post or essay or book in order to get results out of tools like this. I just don't have the time for that. I did it for the past year because I thought we were getting somewhere, but I realized that th that's exhausting. Working with a tool like this, um, having to write an essay or a book or a requirements manual, um, I'd rather write that kind of thing for human beings, but I don't want to write that for a machine. You know, it's different when you're writing it for other people. You know, there's a little bit of, um, of just a, a nice dab of emotion there where you're, you're trying to work with others and you're trying to work towards a team result here. But when you're using a, a large language model like this, you're really working with yourself. You're just using uh, this tool to actually translate something. And I can do that. I can do that better then I can do that better into my own efforts, um, just building the solution, than having the obvious echoed back to me, right? Um, but I did like that, um, that what the approach that I use, uh, according to what this is, is, is sourcing out there, is... Um, very much the way that um, code is done in the real world. It matches the more contemporary way of designing a solution. So basically, this is the approach that you would use to build a Amazon.com, a Netflix.com, a Google.com. Uh, the approaches that I use is how you develop software in the modern age. And so all that study and scholarship that I've done from the late 1990s up until present, all those books that I've read, it's paid off. So, so um, this actually gives me more confidence in the direction that I'm going to take when writing computer programs from the foreseeable future. But I'm really going back to the past because my earliest 
and I mean my earliest mentors, uh, those in the late 90s and the early 2000s, my earliest mentors, those who are in the position I'm in now in terms of experience, this is exactly what they try to um, inform me to, to do. And um, at that time, I just wanted to do the, the what was the hot new stuff, right? Which was to write these um, intricate, object-oriented hierarchies and, you know, every once in a while, I would see a, um, an, a well-seasoned, experienced um, uh, developer, um, someone who's really good with uh, software development, and they would talk about as finite state machines and table-driven design, um, table-driven uh, programs. And it took uh, a good while, but I eventually got there several years ago, I'd say about, and I know when I say several years ago, it looks like the recent future, the recent history, right? But when you're talking about a career that spans decades or a practice of writing software where, you know, some people, they, they write software for 40 years, right? I'm only um, 25 years into it, but you got people that write software for 40 years, some 60 years. I mean, if you think about Dr. Donald Knuth, uh, he's in his 80s and he's still writing software, right? And um, he's been doing software, I think, since uh, his 20s. So that's almost uh, 60, almost 70 years he's writing uh, software, right? So I'm only a quarter into that, only a quarter into that. And so it's like, it's like the more experience you get, the more you see recurring patterns that cut across all the trends, cut across all the fads. And in this case, in the world of software development, it uh, really does come down to uh, uh, state transitions and um, a hierarchical um, movement of information. And then you can make tweaks within those uh, zones of, of states. You can make tweaks uh, dealing with things like uh, caching, cache locality or locality of reference, for example. And so I'm starting to see that, and you just keep the bigger picture in place. Um, so I'm going to wrap up by saying this, is that if you go in the direction of uh, finite state machines, whether you're writing video games, because it's a, it's a huge thing in video games. I mean, video games are largely um, finite state machines. <coughs> then what I realize is that the master stroke is having a hierarchy of S FSMs, a hierarchy of F F FSMs. I need, I need to write this as a blog post. I've been writing blog posts here recently, so I've gotten back to that. And I'm, I'm probably going to do a blog post on this at some point um, once I've proven this out a little bit more. But having a, I've actually done this, what I'm saying. I've done a hierarchy of F FSMs, but if you're not cognizant of that's what you're doing, it can get a little messy towards the end. But I think you can do it cleanly as a clean architectural approach. And it's an approach that would transcend object-oriented programming, functional programming, and procedural programming. That is, it doesn't matter which way you go. You can go either one of those um, approaches and you can use FSMs in any of those approaches and you're still going to end up with a much uh, better program than you would if you got too deeply uh, embedded in, in uh, OOP or functional programming or uh, procedural programming, if you get too much into those. But you can use FSM as a universal approach to programs, regardless of what the, the, uh, the paradigm is. And use FSM as like a meta paradigm to uh, order and structure programs so that you can write them more reliably and in a much more standardized way that applies to all skill levels and uh, experience levels, right? So I'm not setting out to prove that to anybody because I don't have time for that. I'm going to build some programs here in the near future. And um, I didn't expect this outcome in this chat with uh, ChatGPT, but it's actually bolstered my confidence that um, in my approach that I'm going to take. And it's actually going to make me much more productive, even though I'm not going to use um, ChatGPT. Um, 
but it's definitely going to uh, bolster my my efforts in writing uh, programs in C++ on Linux that um, do certain things um, for a particular community of people that I will be addressing uh, here in the near future on a very important um, very important set of processes that I feel unless my research um, shows otherwise that I feel hasn't been addressed um, um, at any point in the past or 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 would be approached in the near future so I hope you like this conversation um, this was very illuminating to me and um, I will catch you on the next one